morning. We are in the book of Mark, Mark chapter 14, 43 through 52. And you'll see that it corresponds with Matthew 26, Luke 22, and John 18. The title of the sermon this morning is Scriptures Fulfilled. All right, and to keep in context, we are in the 14th day of Nisan, the, the Jewish month of Nisan, and it is the Passover. And last week, or two weeks ago, we looked at the Passover and Jesus instituting the Lord's Supper. Last week, we looked at the garden scene where Jesus is in the garden of Gethsemane and praying. Today, we're going to look at the betrayal. Next will be the trial scenes, then the cross scene, then his death in the tomb, and then find the resurrection and then his ascension. So that's the track that we are following. But for this morning, I'd like to read the scripture first uh, in entirety, and then we'll go back to it. So it starts in verse 43. Immediately while he was still speaking, Judas, one of the twelve, came up accompanied by a crowd with swords and clubs who were from the chief priests and scribes and elders. Now he who was betraying him had given them a signal, saying, Whomever I kiss, he is the one. Seize him and lead him under guard. After coming, Judas immediately went to him, saying, Rabbi, and kissed him. They laid hands on him and seized him. But one of those who stood, uh, stood by drew his sword and struck the slave of the high priest and cut off his ear. And Jesus said to them, Have you come out with swords and clubs to arrest me as you would against a robber? Every day I was with you in the temple teaching, and you did not seize me. But this has taken place to fulfill the scriptures. And they all left him and fled. A young man was following him, wearing nothing but a linen sheet over his naked body, and they seized him. But he pulled free and of the linen sheet and escaped naked. Thus the reading of the word. If we were to look at this very familiar passage, um, the short version of summarizing it would basically be Judas betrays Jesus with a kiss and the soldiers take him away. There's your summary of the passage so we can leave and we can go out to Delaney's and have our dinner. But uh, familiar passages require us to do some digging. One of the ways that we could look at this passage of scripture is looking at Jesus and the different positions he's in so at one position would be the betrayed one that's what's happening with judas then he's the misunderstood one where he's questioning why are you coming out with clubs and swords then he's the submitted one where he is willingly uh going he's not dragging his feet and then the deserted one where we will find him all alone that's one way you could look at the passage another is to look at yourself and look at how this relates to you. So you could start by asking the question, have you been betrayed? Or maybe uh, a tougher question would be, have you betrayed anyone? Um, and then how, did, how do you feel? How does that make you feel? You could look at that. You could talk about gun control because there's a little sword. That's a joke. And, or you could look at the first streaker at the end of it. But let's look back at the passage now, verse by verse. And get some insight from God. So verse 43, immediately while he, Jesus, was still speaking, Judas, one of the twelve. He makes a point there to say this is one of the twelve. This is not somebody outside of the group. This is Judas. Came up, accompanied by a crowd with swords and clubs, who were from the chief priests and the scribes and the elders. Some things to note. First is in Mark's account. Judas and Jesus are the only ones mentioned by name in this passage of Scripture. Everybody else is unnamed. Uh, the, the disciple that pulls the sword is unnamed. The, the, the man that flees away at the end is unnamed. The, the chief priests and scribes are not named. So Judas and Jesus are the only ones named in this passage by Mark. Second thing is that Mark doesn't mention Judas again after the betrayal. In Mark's account, this is the last time you will read Judas's name. And then three N's. The first N is night. It happens at night. It's not during the day when there could have been a riot or something like that. So it happened at night. Then there's numbers. 
Uh, some say that there could have been two to five hundred people that come out to get Jesus. Um, that they that the the temple guards and the Roman guards and the chief priests and scribes that it could have been up to five hundred people that were coming out to get little Jesus. And then nunchucks, nunchucks. Uh, they came out with clubs and swords. And 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 it's interesting this whole big crowd coming out to get Jesus himself. And and maybe they do have some uh, concern. Um, we know that we just read not too long ago when he comes into Jerusalem, he goes into the temple, and what's he do? All on his own, he drives out, out of the 35 acres of the temple, he drives out all the tax collectors and sinners and everybody that was selling in the in the temple. I mean, so he, he's got some stamina, he's got some luck, so maybe they felt like they needed all these clubs and all these swords to come at him. Verse 44, now he who was betraying him had given them a signal saying, Whomever I kiss, he is the one. Seize him and lead him away under guard. So we need to look at the kiss. First thing about the kiss is that it shows that Judas was a skilled hypocrite. He was a skilled hypocrite. They, the, the other disciples did not know. Uh, they were snowed. Now, Jesus wasn't. Jesus pointed him out. But the other disciples, when, when Jesus got up to leave the Passover, they just thought he was going out to get some more food. He was trusted with the money back. When Jesus asked, one of you is going to betray me, or says one of you is going to betray me, they don't all point to Jesus, Judas and says, oh, it must be him. <laughs> they look at themselves and say, is it I? Be because Judas has done such a good job at being in the group, but not of the group. Another thing is that Jesus had to be pointed out. Jesus had to be pointed out. He didn't have a halo. He didn't have a glow or anything like that. He was just a regular Jewish guy. And Judas was telling this large crew that, okay, I got to point him out to you so that you know exactly which one to seize. That's Judas. And then there's no hesitation on Judas' part. And we'll see that in the next verse too. He's got a plan. He knows exactly what he's going to do. And he is going to turn Jesus over. Now, something more about kiss, the kiss is in the, that culture and still a little bit today, a slave would kiss your feet, would get down on the ground and kiss your feet. Now, if someone was inferior to you in class, they would kiss your hand. So you, you would hold out the hand and they would kiss your hand. But equals, equals kiss cheeks. So now you get a sense when Judas comes up and kisses Jesus, he doesn't kiss him as a servant he or a slave. He doesn't kiss him as an inferior to him. He kisses him as if I am equal to you. So verse 45, after coming, Jesus, Judas immediately went to him saying, Rabbi, and kissed him. I call you Rabbi, I call you teacher and everything, but I, I deem you as an equal of mine. So that really plays into looking at the corruption and the moral blindness of Judas. Judas has been with Jesus for three and a half years. He has seen all the miracles. He has seen, heard all the teachings. He saw all the proclamations. And still, he, he, Jesus is not his Lord. And uh, the focus, the focus is what Judas wanted Jesus to do and not what Jesus wanted Judas to do. See, Judas wanted Jesus to be a uh, military messiah and take the Romans out and Jews would be on top again. That's what he wanted. Um, that's what he wanted G G Jesus to do. But Jesus is the one who wanted Judas to take up his cross and follow me. And Jesus is the one that wanted Judas to have a total transformation of his life. And that throws the question back at us. What is our focus when we look at Jesus? Do we look at Jesus... And do we say, Jesus, I want you to do this, and I want you to do this, and I want you to do this for me, and that for me, and, and that's the whole focus? Or is our focus that I want to be what Jesus wants me to do? I want to do what Jesus wants me to do. And now, that's not to earn your salvation or anything like that. No, it's just all about the focus of saying, I'm a follower of Jesus Christ, and therefore, I, I, I want to take up the cross that Jesus has given me and follow after him. I don't want to have the focus where I'm always in this just for what he can do for me. No, I, I, I want to do for him. So verse 46, they laid hands on him and seized him. 
I want you to look at the group that came and laid hands on him. Uh, there's the military, there's the politicians, and there's the religious leaders. Matthew, Luke, and John fill this in, that there's the military, there's the temple guard, there's the Roman soldiers, there's the politicians, there's the ones who are of the Sanhedrin who make the laws and, and, and fill those out. And then there's the religious leaders, the, the Pharisees, who's the keepers of the law. And these three groups are together in this effort to capture Jesus. Now, let me say that nothing of good comes when religious leaders team up with politicians who have charge of the military. Nothing good comes of that. If I could illustrate this, if I go to this side of the state, this is the church. And the church is an entity all of its own. And it, its focus is the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and, and its whole drive is that. Now, over here on the other side of the state is the government. It's the politicians. It's the lawmakers. It's the, it's the military. And those have been ordained by God. They've been ordained by God to punish the wrong and reward the right. And when we get out of that realm, then we get in trouble. But that's what God has ordained that government to do. The problem comes in is when a church adopts a political party or a church adopts a certain government. Because when you try to marry the two together, one of them is going to compromise. One is going to be influenced more than the other. And most likely, it's the church that's going to be influenced the way of the government or the politicians or the military. It doesn't go the other way. They will compromise. The church, its whole focus is Jesus is Lord. That's not the focus of government. That's not the focus of the military. And so we need to very much beware when we try to marry a church with any type of political organization or uh, and try to mix them together because we, we will compromise what we believe. We will maybe say, well, you know, for the good of other things, then I'm going to set this principle kind of aside a little bit. We, we can't do that. Um, so that's the group that's coming to take away the Messiah of the world. The, the one that the religious leaders are supposed to be is looking for. Verse 47. But one of those who stood by drew his sword and struck the slave of the high priest and cut off his ear. Now, we could guess who this is, <laughs> but we know by John's account that it is Peter swinging the sword. And the high priest's slave is named Malchus. And we find out it's his right ear. And we find out that um, from Luke's account, the, the physician, that Jesus picks up the ear and, and instantly heals him. It, it puts it right back on his head and heals it. And that must have been quite a sight. Uh, so all this commotion going on, everything going on, clubs, swords, and everything else. And you can see Peter doing this, pulling out his sword, swiping at him. You know that he's not swiping off to cut off his ear. He's swiping to cut off his head, but the guy sees it coming, ducks, and he gets his ear. And Jesus, in the midst of all of that, reaches down, grabs the guy's ear, Malchus' ear, and puts it up there. This is the only time he does this. He instantly heals the flesh wound. And boom, he puts it back up. You can imagine Malcolm just Malchus just touching his ear, feeling his ear like, wow, what is all happening here? But again, we get all of these details from the scripture. It help us, it gives credibility that what it's talking about is not made up. This actually did happen. Now, verse 48. And Jesus said, Have you come out with swords and clubs to arrest me as you would against a robber? And in Matthew's account, Jesus talks to Peter specifically about pulling out the sword. And Peter took the law into his own hands at that point and therefore would come under punishment uh, under the laws that would punish him. What I mean by that is that Peter was trying to solve the situation by the sword. If you try to solve the situation by the sword, the sword can be used against you. That's what Jesus is telling him. You try to solve it by man's ways, man's going to be able to use his weapons on you, the same ones that you're using against him. And then Jesus turns to the crowd and says, you know, you got these clubs and these swords and everything, but I have at my disposal, Jesus says, over 12 legions of angels. 
Now, if you kind of multiply that out, a legion is 6,000. So he's got over 12,000. So you have at least 72,000 angels at his disposal. How much damage can an angel do? Well, in Scripture, in the Old Testament, there's a time when it's told that an angel uh, took out 185,000 men. One angel did that. So that means, if you multiply that out, that Jesus had at his disposal uh, the fighting power of over 13 billion in the face of what is coming at him with clubs and swords. So it's, 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 it, here's the point, is that we have different weapons. That's what he's telling Peter. Don't use the weapons of the world. We have different weapons. And what are our weapons? Our weapons are preaching prayer and preaching God's word. Prayer and preaching God's word. That's the weapons of the church. Those are the weapons that we are to use to fight against the evil of this world. And we need to make sure that we fight with godly weapons. Because if we, okay, if, if you use the sword, then the sword can be used against you. If you use prayer and the preaching of the word, they're stymied because they don't know how to use those weapons. They don't even know how to use those weapons back. And plus, those weapons are more powerful. See, the kingdom of God doesn't advance by force. It doesn't advance by force, but by one by one being born again through faith in Jesus Christ. Now, there are other kingdoms. There are other kingdoms that try to advance by force and other religions that try to advance by force. But Christianity does not do that. Christianity advances by one by one a person coming to know Jesus Christ, being born again through faith in Christ. Um, so let's not give them any more ammunition. Let's not give them any more ammunition. So verse 49, Jesus goes on to say, Every day I was with you in the temple teaching, and you did not seize me. But this has taken place to fulfill the scriptures. There's the title. This all happened to fulfill the scriptures. It's not Pilate's show. It's not Judas' show. It's not the Sanhedrin show. It's none of their shows. What is happening is because it is ordained by Scripture to fulfill Scripture that Jesus would be betrayed. betrayed. And so Jesus is walking God's will. And he's walking God's will because it is necessary for him to do it. And actually, he's the only one who can do it. He's the only sinless one who can go to the cross. It's, it's voluntary that he does it. That he willingly goes, he, he, he gives his life, his life is not taken from him, he gives it voluntarily. And it's substitutionary that Jesus is the one who goes to the cross in your place. And the cross is, it's a beautiful picture. It's where God's love and God's justice meet for us. So if you think of, think of the two beams of the cross, uh, let's take the vertical beam, would be God's justice. There needs to be a justice uh, for sin. There needs to be a penalty to be paid, and the penalty is death. And so that's justice. That's God's justice. But then God comes in with his love. That's the horizontal beam, and he says, okay, there's justice to be met, but out of my love, I'm going to send my one and only son, and he is going to pay the price. And out of love, he's going to pay the price, be the substitute for your sin. So then, verse 50, they all left him and fled. And if I could remind you, just back to verse 27, it says, And Jesus said to them, You will all fall away, because it is written, I will strike down the shepherd, and the sheep will be scattered. See, Jesus continues to give them these mini prophecies, these, these near future prophecies that, you know, 25 verses prior to this, he says, you're going to all fall away. And as they're running away, I can't help but think that they would think, oh, Jesus just said this was going to happen. And then we have this little scene at the end, verse 51. And the young man was following, wearing nothing but a linen sheet over his naked body, and they seized him. And the question is, who is this guy? Some think it's Mark himself. Um, and, 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 you know, Mark's mom was a follower of Jesus, and maybe Judas came to Mark's mom's house and to see if Jesus was there and didn't find him there. And therefore, he kind of woke up Mark, and 
Mark heard the whole corrupt, uh, uh, all this commotion going on. And so Mark wraps his linen bed sheet around him and stumbles out of the house and follows after Judas and the crowd to, to find Jesus. Now, you've got a whole movie there, but we don't know that. What we know is someone was awakened from their sleep. We know that because of what they're wearing. And, and they, they followed out there to see what was going on. They heard the commotion to see what's going on. And, and what happens was all the disciples flee, and here's this guy in this linen sheet. And the people look around and go, he must be with him. He must be one of them. And they grab and seize him. They grab him, and they, and they, and they won't let him go. So the next verse, verse 52, but he pulled free of the linen sheet and escaped naked. Now, this shows how terrible the scene was to risk nakedness. If you put yourself in that position, you're naked, but you got this sheet around you. You get captured. You've got some options here. One option is, is that you don't do anything, or you try to talk your way out of it, or you say, I'm not with him, or you think, well, they're going to take me down to the station and at least question me. Maybe at the station they'll have some clothes, but I'm not going to risk nakedness. I'm not going to risk leave. I'm holding on to this sheet. This is all I got is this sheet. I'm holding on to it. So that's it. But this guy doesn't do that. This must have been a terrible, terrific, terrible, terrifying situation that he risks nakedness to run as fast as he can in the other direction. And what I want to point out here is that Jesus is now all alone. Not only are his disciples not there, but even an unnamed guy, wakened from his sleep, has fled the scene. He doesn't, there's nobody who wants to be with Jesus. Now, Jesus has his captors around him, but there, there's nobody right now who wants to be with Jesus. So let me close with three points. The first point is this, is that scriptures must be fulfilled, all of them. All of the scriptures must be fulfilled. Even this one like this where he's going to be betrayed and crucified, it needs to be fulfilled. So the scriptures about a coming Messiah, all fulfilled. The scriptures that come about the Messiah coming again, his second coming, will be all fulfilled. The scriptures about God's judgment will all be fulfilled. The scriptures about heaven will be fulfilled. The scriptures about hell will be fulfilled. What you have in your hand, the word of God, will all be fulfilled. Fulfilled. That's point number one. Point number two is we can be quick to fall away. We can be quick to fall away. Look at these disciples. At one point, just about 20 verses before, 25 verses before, they are bragging in the face of Jesus. When Jesus says, you're going to all fall away, they say, uh-uh, not me. I'm going to stand here. I, I, I am not going to fall away. There's no way. We're, we're, we go to the grave with you. That's where we're at. Very prideful statement. Just a couple verses later, we're in the garden. And Jesus says, okay, I want you to stay here and pray. That's what I want you to do. Please stay here and pray. So Jesus goes and prays. He comes back. What does he find them doing? They're sleeping. Well, man, it sure doesn't look like they're, they're, they'll do anything for Jesus. Jesus asked them to pray. And what are they doing? They're sleeping on him. And now, just a few verses later, Jesus is faced with his betrayer. And Jesus is faced with his fellow. And what do they do? They run away. Man, that's a long way. That's a quick amount of time to go from bragging that you'd never leave him to running in the other direction. Can I point out that this is us? There are times when we get, get pretty proud about who we are, and we're a Christian, and we bleed Christ, and, and we're at the church morning, morning noon, and night, and, and, and we, you know, we know all these verses and everything else, and we can puff ourselves up to being so prideful to not long being in a situation where God is asking you, when's the last time you had a quiet time? Well, you know, Jesus, it's been really busy. I've been busy and stuff like that. When's the last time you talked to me? Well, you know, I try to talk to you, and I listen to the Christian radio station, and, you know, I try to get you in here and there. You know, it's just really busy, and, and there's other ways really to serve you and worship you. You know, I don't want to box myself into one way. And so you just start making all these excuses, and then – then you get in a situation where maybe somebody's asking about your faith, but you have a feeling that if you answer in the affirmative, they might not like it. And so it's really easy in those situations for you to say, well, you know, if they ask you, you go to church? For you to say, well, you know, not all the time. You know, I go because my wife wants me to go or, 
I go for the kids, or it's a good thing, and you know, all makes it look good on their resume, kind of thing, first showing, kind of thing. But that's really all it is for me. It's just about that. You can see how easy it is to go from a prideful Christian to a running away Christian, Christian very, very fast. And then the last point is that Jesus didn't come to add to your happiness, but to save you. We have to remember why he came. He came to save us. He didn't come to add to our happiness. Now, happiness is a benefit of following Christ. But sometimes that's the thing we focus in on. I mean, you get to be a part of this group. You get to be a part of a, a body of Christ, and there's smiling people, and they know your name, and you get a hug, and, 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 and they have things that you don't have, and you get to borrow them. And, and it's just all like all these connections are going on, and man, it just makes you so happy and everything. But that's not why Jesus came. Jesus came not to make you happy, but to make you holy. He came to die on the cross for your sins. And that's why every month we come to this communion table. We as followers of Jesus Christ, we are remain remembered by the symbol of the bread and symbol of the cup that Jesus came and he died so that I could have forgiveness of sins, I could have eternal life. That's why I came and that's why I live. I live not to be happy. I live to be holy. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I pray that you would watch over us as we take the bread and the cup this morning. That we would um, realize again that we are not your equal. No, no, we need to be on our hands and knees kissing your feet. We need to be servants of yours. And that all scripture is to be fulfilled. So we live in, in light of that. We also live in the light that it is very easy to fall away if we're not focused on being servants of yours. Lord, thank you that you didn't come just to make us happy. That would be temporal. But you came to make us holy. That's eternal. And it's what you did, not what we have done. So, Lord, as we take the bread and the cup this morning, may we be face to face with that fact. May we take it accordingly. If we need to confess, that we confess. If we, if we need to, uh, we need to take it with a rejoicing heart. If we need to abstain this morning, because there is something we need to take care of before we come back to the table and actually follow through on what you want us to do. May, may our hearts be clear and our hands holy this morning as we take the bread and the cup. In thy precious name, amen.